Thank you for joining us. I'm Joe Condon, and we are honored to have with us this week the Bishop of the Albany Roman Catholic Diocese, Bishop Howard Hubbard, who has been a priest in the Albany Roman Catholic Diocese for half a century. That sounds longer than 50 years when you say it that way. <laughs> it, it does, and sometimes it feels like it. <laughs> Bishop Hubbard, it is so nice to uh, have you with us today. And uh, unfortunately, I, I'm giving my personal opinion, you're going to be uh, wrapping up your uh, tenure as uh, Bishop of the Albany uh, Roman Catholic uh, Diocese this year, and you are truly going to be missed. We, uh, we all feel badly about that, and uh, I just wanted to let you know we love what you've done, and uh, we appreciate what you've done. Well, I appreciate your kind words, and I'm very grateful to all the many people who have been so responsive and supportive to my ministry since 1963. Now, you grew up in the uh, city of Troy on the uh, Hudson River. For those, This is also airing in other markets. For those who don't know, very close to uh, Albany, New York, and Schenectady, New York. What You were going to St. Patrick's uh, School in Troy. What made you decide that you wanted to enter the priesthood, or did you decide at that point? Well, I didn't decide during my grammar school years, although the seeds were probably planted then because I was an altar server, and I got to know the priest very well. I also played CYO baseball and basketball. Okay. We used to have four priests in the parish in those days, and one would always come to all of our games and afterwards take us out for a soda or a bite to eat. Mm -hmm. And so I got to know the priests as human beings. I was very impressed how involved they were in the lives of the parishioners, and I think just getting to know them, to like them, to be acquainted with the type of ministry they exercised was really the foundation for my vocation. After graduating from St. Patrick's in Troy, I went to LaSalle Institute in Troy. And on I was, 4th Street then, right? On 4th Street. It was before they moved to their present location. And I was invited by the brothers uh, to go to a weekend retreat to consider being a brother. And while I admired the brothers greatly, their main responsibility was education. And I didn't see myself as a teacher. So while I appreciated being invited to uh, consider their community, I was still thinking by my senior year in high school of priesthood, law, and journalism. And uh, during the course of the summer, it so happened that uh, a friend of my family had a son who had gone to CBA who announced that he was going to the seminary. And uh, my plan was really to go to Siena College, take a general liberal arts course, and then at the end of that decide whether I was going to the priesthood. But when I saw the positive reaction my parents had to their friend having a son going into seminary, it made me kind of rethink. And I thought, well, if I go to Siena, I still don't know what the priest is going to be like. Maybe I got to reverse course, try the seminary. If it doesn't seem to be a good fit, then switch back to Siena. And so that's what I did. I was accepted to, in August for Labor Day entrance into the seminary. Modern that, Christie, right? Modern Christie. That wouldn't happen today. It's almost a, at least a year formation uh, uh, in terms of interviews and psychological testing and so forth before one gets accepted in the seminary. So uh, by today's standards, uh, uh, I might have been accepted, but not the way I was accepted. Now, at that time, I believe Bishop Gibbons was head of the uh, diocese. Is that no, Bishop Gibbons was living at the time in retirement okay. at Mater Christi. He had retired in 1954. I entered the seminary in 1956 under Bishop Scully. Okay, I'll tell you why I think Bishop Gibbons, and now it makes sense, because the Modern Christian Seminary had a uh, an open house, and I was from the St. Patrick's Parish in Albany, and my parents went out there one day, and he was the one, I remember, uh, 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 kneeling down and kissing his ring, and he was the one that was welcoming everyone now. Oh, yes, he, he would be there every visitor's day, and he would welcome everybody, and uh, sometimes, quite frankly, uh, we as seminarians would avoid him. Our parents <laughs> would come once a month. We had a once a month visiting day, and you'd like to spend the time with your parents, but if uh, Bishop Gibbons got a hold of you and took you on a tour, that was the end of any interaction with your parents because that dominated the afternoon. So in many ways, we used to kind of sneak around him so we wouldn't have to take the tour and could chat with our parents and our siblings. Well, growing up in the Albany Roman Catholic Diocese, I remember Bishop Gibbons and Bishop uh, Scully as two of uh, the giants. So you had two of the giants uh, 
r- ruling the diocese, and at the same time you had their influence. Uh, I did indeed, and then during my second year at Mater Christi, uh, Bishop McGinn was installed as our auxiliary bishop, and uh, I had the opportunity of attending his uh, Ordination as a bishop, although I would put attend in quotes because we processed in down the center aisle at the outset of the ceremony, took a left at the altar, went out the Jefferson Street side of the cathedral, got on a bus and went home. So there was no room for us in the cathedral to actually stay there for the ordination, but I was there in the procession for the ordination. Now, he was a very uh, powerful figure in the Albany Roman Catholic Diocese. Oh, yes, he had been the vicar general under Bishop Gibbons from 1936 until uh, my tenure. So that was a long time, and in those days, the vicar general exercise a great deal of responsibility in the diocese. Now, after uh, Mater Christi, was off to uh, Dunwoody? I went to Dunwoody for two years. I did my philosophy at Dunwoody, and then I spent four years at the North American College in Rome studying at the Jesuit Gregorian University. When you were studying in uh, the New York City area, what was that like? What what kind of influences? I mean, you're right there. St. Patrick's Cathedral is down this down the road. Well, we were considered uh, upstaters, and so uh, uh, at first... Uh, even in the church. <laughs> even in the church. Uh, and uh, In fact, I used to consider Yonkers upstate wow. in those days. And uh, I remember uh, the first major event we had there was uh, the uh, Moore Lectures. And uh, the lecturer on that occasion, whose name escapes me, said how great it was to come up in the country, to enjoy the day in the country. And they used to, in the homiletics classes, uh, suggest that you had to uh, have homilies that would relate to your parishioners. So, but people from upstate would be talking a lot about cows and chickens and farmland activities that would uh, resonate with the uh, parishioners. That, that would have been uh, the time in the New York City area of uh, Cardinal Spellman and Bishop Sheen. Card- Cardinal Spellman was the uh, Cardinal Archbishop of New York, yes, and Bishop Sheen was doing his weekly uh, television show. He was a major uh, television star back at that time, wasn't he? He was a major star. He was on at the same time as Milton Burrell. They were competitors. And Bishop Broderick, my predecessor, was his director of communications and used to uh, supervise all of his shows. So I know a lot of stories about Bishop Sheen from uh, Bishop Broderick's time spent with him. Well, I still run those uh, Bishop Sheen shows on EWTN. And what's fascinating, when you look at today's uh, technology and everything that the TV networks have to work with. And uh, back then it was so primitive, and this guy held that half-hour show all by himself. Well, he had a, a, an eloquent way of preaching. He uh, was very insightful, engaging, and he had those eyes that pierced right through you. So uh, he was a major figure, and he's now being considered for uh, beatification in wow. the church. And Bishop Broderick also served as the secretary to uh, Cardinal Spellman. So uh, I heard a lot of stories from Bishop Broderick about both of these men, and they were both real giants of churchmen in the 1950s and 60s. Now, from uh, Dunwoody, it was off to uh, the Vatican, as you alluded to earlier. Tell us about that. What was that like? Well, it was very, very exciting. First of all, you had an opportunity to meet with seminarians from every state in the Union. Plus, when you went to class at Gregorian University, you were with students from every part of the globe. So you had a sense of the universality of the Catholic Church. The other thing is that During the course of my years there, we had uh, the inauguration of the Second Vatican Council. So to be present at the council, and we were there in the square when the council opened on October 11th. That would have been Pope John the 23rd? It was Pope John the 23rd, and it was my mother's birthday the day the council opened, and we were there in the square when all the uh, council fathers processed into the basilica. I think there was about 2,500. And then in the courses that we were receiving at the Gregorian University, many of the professors there were what they call peritae to the uh, council fathers. In other words, they were preparing a lot of the draft texts that the bishops were deliberating on. And uh, we were getting that material firsthand. So in a certain sense, we were receiving what would be the fruits of the council even before they had been formally promulgated. 
I also was there at the time that John the 23rd, who was so beloved, passed away from cancer and for the election of a new Pope, Paul VI. So it was a very exciting time to be in Rome and to be a part of that uh, very significant stage in the history of the church. That had to uh, be a rather sad time to, to lose. So I remember him as a kid, and he had... He was a great communicator, John the Twenty Third, and uh, not to take away from Pope Paul the Sixth, but he was not the same sort of communicator. Well, he was very much like our present Pope Francis. Right. He he was not uh, a kind of a reserved Vatican diplomat, but he, uh, although he was in a diplomatic corps, but he had that uh, down to earth sense of humanity. I remember him bringing children up to the papal throne and hugging them and, uh, you know, speaking to them and to their parents uh, just like a parish priest would to his parishioners at the grassroots level, and that's what made him so beloved. How many years were you at the Vatican? Well, I studied there for four years, from 1960 to 1964. What's your greatest memory? Well, my greatest memory, I think, besides the ones I've just cited, which right. are right up there, was to meet uh, John F. Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline when they visited the Vatican. And after their visit to the Vatican, they came to the North American College, and each of the seminarians uh, were present, and the president came around and <clears throat> spoke to each of us personally, and that was a great memory. That was just uh, four months prior to his death. Yeah. I saw that you were ordained shortly after uh, President yes, Kennedy he, he left us. Yes, he was uh, killed in November of 63, and I was ordained the following month. You come back to uh, Albany, New York after four years at the Vatican. That must have been a little bit of a letdown. Oh, no, I was so happy <laughs> to be home. I mean, I, I love my time in Rome, but I miss my family and my friends here. Another uh, memory that's a sad memory is that uh, my first year at the North American College, my father passed away. Uh -huh. And at the time, uh, seminarians were not allowed to come back for a family funeral. Now, that changed subsequently, but uh, right. I think it was the only crisis I ever faced in my vocation as to whether or not I should go home and risk uh, being dropped as a seminarian or remain where I was. And my mother called me, and I remember in those days, a, a transatlantic call was a big deal. You had to pre-note it sometime in advance. And she told me, your father would want only that which is going to be most fulfilling for you. And if this is going to any way interfere with your study for the priesthood and you want to be a priest, then you stay there. And so that was very reassuring for me. Now, when you came back uh, to the Capital Region, uh, I didn't realize this until I was researching you. you uh, I always think of you as an Albany guy, but you uh, started in Schenectady. I started in Schenectady, and at the time I didn't drive. <laughs> so uh, for the first two weeks in my assignment at St. Joseph's in Schenectady, I had to rely on parishioners to take me to the hospitals and to visit the homebound. I was uh, substituting for Father Ken Tunney, who was away at school for the summer. And uh, I also then worked on getting my driver's license, and after two weeks I was able to master enough of the uh, instructions and the, and the mechanics that I passed my test. I suppose the collar didn't hurt me either. And uh, at the end of that summer, I was assigned permanently to the cathedral. Uh, with Monsignor for, Jones? With Monsignor Jones for a year. And they always say, uh, one of the greatest blessings in your life or one of the greatest curses can be your first pastor. I couldn't have got a more holy, generous, and ideal role model for priesthood than I did in Monsignor Jones. And when I became ordained a priest, I wanted nothing but to be a parish priest. And Monsignor Jones uh, gave me full range of activities in the parish, but he also appointed me as principal of the parish school, the Cathedral Academy. So you did get into teaching after all. I did get into teaching, but I, I, I was smart. The the uh, superior for the common of the Sister St. Joseph's, which staffed the school, was a teacher I had in the eighth grade at St. Patrick's in Troy. And when I was appointed principal, I went to her and said, Sister, I know nothing about education. So I said, I will be the principal in name, but you will be the principal in fact. I will be your gopher. And that's what I did. I mainly went out and visited families. I did teach a, a, 
once a week a religion course for the seventh and eighth graders, and also I taught a Latin course for the seventh and eighth graders. But other than that, I mainly work with the parents and the family members and the uh, PTA association. What was that sister's name? She's still living, Sister Aunt Therese, and I'll be seeing her uh, on a regular basis. I'd see her on a regular basis, I should say, when I visit the provincial house. So